Hey guys, what is up? John here from fly8mikealpha.com and today we'll be taking you start to finish through a full length private pilot oral exam, helping you get ready for your check ride. Now, the beginning of this video is here for free on YouTube to check out the full length video, start to finish, two hours, of Private Pilot Oral that is online in our premium Private Pilot Ground School that will help you prepare for your Private Pilot Checkride. We guarantee you will pass your Private Pilot Checkride when you sign up for that membership there on flyatmikealpha.com. The link is right in the description below if you want to watch the full length of this video helping you get ready for that checkride. Any questions on this video or any questions you have on the material contained in this video, you can always leave it in the comments right below. And of course, reach out to us via email at cfi at flightmikealpha.com or calling the office number 234-738-2582. Happy to help you any way we can to get ready for that private pilot check ride. Without further ado, let's get to it. All right, well, Garrett, thank you uh, so much for coming in today. Yeah. It's a very chilly day outside, but hopefully today we'll be making you a private pilot. Uh, so... We've already uh, gone through all of your documents. We reviewed your logbook. Everything looked good. You had all your required aeronautical experience in there. Um, got some other sheets here you can keep for now. I got your knowledge test report here that I wanted to look through and looks really great. Uh, 96%. So just uh, two questions there. Looks like you missed the two questions uh, relating to towing gliders. Those are, uh, are you playing the towing gliders, Gary? <laughs> no, I'm not. Oh, well, that's okay. Um, yeah, I think you understand that, yeah. you know, you need to... Uh, need to, you know, at least have 100 hours and stuff like that before towing and, and three toes under the supervision of a pilot every 24 months. So that's that's all fine. Um, anyways, today, this is just a conversation. And the idea here is just to kind of go through and, you know, get the knowledge out of you, make sure you have the knowledge at the private pilot level. We're looking for a level of knowledge that uh, you, we just want to make sure you have it. I'm not going to expect you to teach me anything here. Not expecting you to, uh, you know, put on this awesome performance. Yeah. Just looking to uh, get the knowledge out of your, you know, head, out of your mouth, and and make sure that uh, you can show me that you actually have this knowledge. As far as I'm concerned, you've already passed. Uh, what I have here is my plan of action on my phone and these uh, little pieces of paper here. And this is right from the ACS, the Airman Certification Standards. No more, no less. We're not talking about anything that's outside the ACS. Everything. Uh, that we're going to be talking about comes right out of the ACS. Hopefully you re you reviewed this before yep. showing up here today. Yep. And uh, at this point, do you have any questions before we get started? No, I don't. Okay. Yep. Yeah, there's three possible outcomes. Um, the one where that we're assuming is going to happen is pass, and you're going to become a private pilot today. Uh, there's the other outcome, which is, hey, you know, maybe we find an area that you got some holes in knowledge. There's some deficiencies. We'll we'll send you back to your CFI, and you can get retrained on that. Or the third outcome is really under either of our control. Uh, we can discontinue, all mm -hmm. right? So either I can say, hey, you know, I, I'm just not feeling so well, or I'm a little tired, or I'm kind of hungry. We can discontinue. We can come back another day, yep. and that's not a pass or a fail. It's just we're going to pick up where we left off. Uh, and if you uh, decide, hey, you know, you're not feeling so well, you're tired, you're hungry, uh, or you feel like this just, you know, may not be your best day, yeah. then saying, hey, I'd like to discontinue and come back later, that's totally fine, no harm, no foul, no extra fees, anything like that, we can come back and pick up where we left off, and uh, no big deal there. So, uh, then uh, you know where the bathroom is, all that great stuff, yeah. so I think we'll go ahead and jump right into it. Sounds good. Uh, first question I have for you here, uh, let's say you get your private pilot today, okay? So today's January 26th, and so you become a private pilot today. Now, how long can you just keep flying? Say you fly once a week uh -huh. regularly after work. Every day you go up, it's a lot of fun. Yeah. And so you fly once a week. Uh, how long can you do that for before you would require any sort of additional training? Um, well, uh, two years before I need a biannual or my I need my flight review done. It's not okay. biannual anymore. Um, so after two years, I would need to have my flight review. And so January 30th, of, you know, uh, 22. Okay, yep. <laughs> So 2022 now. So um, January then, 30th, you said, or yeah, January yeah. 30th. January 31st. It, yeah, yeah. Kind of. Yeah. You're alluding to like the end of the month. End right? of the month. Yeah. yeah. And is that because it's, it's two years or 24 calendar months? Yeah, 24 calendar months. From okay. What I believe. Yeah, yeah and we to look it up in 61. Sure. <laughs> yeah. So you mentioned it's yeah. in Part 61. What yeah. is that book there? So this is our far aim. Um, this is where we get all our regulations from. So okay. Um, we have our federal aviation regulations and our aeronautical information manual. So like everything that we need to know is in here. So there's our bio. Gotcha. <laughs> yeah, any sort of rules that you want to know about uh, could be in there. So yeah, like you said, you could you could reference that in there in Part yeah, 61. For our flight review, um, yeah, we could look it up. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, that sounds good yeah. to me. So, uh, you know, you wouldn't need any extra training. You're, you're flying once yeah. a week like that until you, you hit that 24 calendar months. Now, let's say 
uh, you know, you go six months without flying, okay. you know, in that same two year period, could you just go out and fly again or? Um, yeah, I can go out and fly again anytime mm -hmm. in that. And it's, if I want to take a passenger, I can't uh, mm -hmm. take them without doing three landings in the last 90 days. Okay. Uh, How does that work? Three. So if it's a daytime landing, if like we're going to go out and fly during the day, and it's a mm -hmm. nice day. I have mm -hmm. to, I can do three takeoff and landings. I don't have to be to a full stop, but. I had to go do three takeoff landings and have them logged in my book before I could take a passenger with me. Okay. And if um, it was at night, I would have to do it to a full stop. Okay, you'd have yeah. to do the night landings to a full stop because you're flying a nose wheel airplane, one, 172? Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Okay, so you're flying a 172. That's great. Fun airplane. Yeah. Um, and you would mentioned day or night. What, when do we make that differentiation? What's the difference between daytime and nighttime? Um, up here in Alaska, it's... Uh, up in here in Alaska. Yeah. So it's like, it's an hour after sunset here, or mm -hmm. civilian twilight for Alaska. Mm -hmm. um, so we have, right now, it's an hour after sunset and mm -hmm. an hour before sunrise. Okay. So yeah, anytime that's... that's logged between those hours is nighttime for us. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. Um, and you mentioned logging nighttime. So mm -hmm. you would, so say sunset's 5 p.m., you would start logging nighttime at 6 p.m.? 6 p.m., yeah. Okay. Um, and... Let me just kind of clear that by that. So you would, let's say civil twilight is 5.30. Mm -hmm. So sunset's 5 p.m. And then we have 5.30 civil twilight and 6 p.m. is one hour after. Okay. When would we start logging that nighttime in our logbook? Um, after 6 p.m. After 6 p.m. Okay. Would, do you think that maybe we log nighttime between civil twilight to civil twilight? So maybe... Yeah, I think there's a rule here in Alaska that we can. It just depends on the time of year, though. Um, yeah, sure. Yeah. We could check in the almanac yeah. and we could see... Uh, yeah, when those times are, interestingly enough, so civil twilight, the definition there is when the sun is six degrees below the horizon. Okay. Some parts of the year, depending on where you're at in Alaska, that doesn't ever happen. Yeah. It never goes six degrees below the horizon. Yeah. Uh, but uh, for our purposes, you know, this is January, it's pretty, and we're in Anchorage, it's pretty normal down here. Yeah. So, uh, you know, let's say sunset's 5 p.m. Okay. And uh, civil twilight, if we look it up, is 526, mm -hmm. and that's when the sun's six degrees below the horizon, when it gets, you know less light out, you know, because yeah. the second the sun goes down, it doesn't get dark on us. So the sun's a little bit uh, below the horizon, it's a little bit less light mm -hmm. out. And then we could start logging night time, yeah. but we couldn't log a night landing until one hour after. after yeah. yeah, that's what you were saying. Yeah, right? yeah okay, that yeah. makes yeah. good sense to me. So it's funny, we can actually log night flight time without yeah. logging a night landing. Yeah. yeah, that's an interesting thing. For so, currency, right? Yeah, yeah for yeah. currency yeah. purposes. Okay, yeah. and I'm glad you brought up currency. We'll talk about that more in a second here. Now, what about... Uh, you know, as far as flying with passengers after sunset, if sunset's 5 p.m., okay. and we want to take off at 4.30 and land somewhere around 5.30 or so, mm -hmm. but we haven't done our three takeoffs and landings to a full stop in the past 90 days, is that okay? Yeah, because we're not night yet. Oh, okay. Well, the night, well, after, it'd have to be before the civil twilight. Or, no, not to be before the nighttime. It would have to be before that, that yeah, one hour. One yeah, hour. so yeah. up to 59 minutes after sunset, we yeah. could carry the passengers. So we could actually log night flight time but not log the night landing yep. and not have the three takeoffs and landings in the oh. past 90 days. Or a full stop. Yeah. yeah, to carry those passengers. Now, you mentioned currency, which yeah. I'm really glad you brought that up. Let's say you get your license today and you don't fly for six months. Okay. You said you don't need any more training for 24 calendar months. I agree with that. Legally, that's what this book here says. Now, th that would be to be current or proficient? Uh, that would be to be current. Okay. Yeah. Now, what's the difference between proficiency and currency? So... Yeah, I mean, if you're current, you I've logged my three landings, and mm -hmm. I've done that in the last 90 days. Mm -hmm. doesn't mean I'm proficient. It means I'm mm -hmm. current on what, okay. the, what the laws tell me I have to be able to do to take a passenger. Gotcha. Or, so currency is legal. Yeah. And then what's proficiency? It means, it means like, so it's different for each person, but it's being good at, you know, mm -hmm. landing and taking off. So it's like I'm actually doing this every, at least once a week. Mm -hmm. And I'm capable of flying this airplane at the specifications of the PUH, let's say. Gotcha. So we could say currency would be legal and yeah. proficiency would be safety. Yeah. So we need to make sure we're safe. So yeah. if you go six months without flying, well, you might be legally current, but would you still be proficient? I mean, in my opinion, no, but okay. maybe somebody well, else, yeah. Sure. Yeah. So, we, I mean, obviously you don't want to just wait another 18 months for that flight review to roll sure, around. Yeah. So what could you do? Get up and go fly in the pattern and, you know, go make okay. myself feel proficient and feel okay. adequate in the airplane and be, you know, capable sure. of flying it safely. Yeah, let's say you decide to go up and do that and maybe it's, uh, you know, it's like 10 gusting 15 that day or something like that and you r grab the airplane from the flight school yep. and, um, you know, there's some CFI standing around. Would you just go up and fly by yourself or? Um, if it was a crosswind, direct crosswind, I'd probably want to ask a CFI to come up okay. and help me. Um, just go yeah. and say I want to work on some crosswind landings and 
Mm -hmm. Hopefully they would be, yeah, they'd yeah. be willing to and wanted to. Certainly, yeah. And if you go six months without flying, might be a good idea, even on a calm day, to have somebody jump in with you, um, another pilot, or preferably yeah. even mm -hmm. another flight instructor, to try to help rebuild that proficiency in you. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, no, that sounds pretty good to me. Um, so that kind of deals with, you know, our certificate and what we have to be current in there. Um, now, when you go flying, you're going to have your certificate with you, or what, what kind of documents do you have to bring with you when you go fly in the airplane? So, in that case, I would just refer to the ARO, so the acronym. You know, mm -hmm. I need the airworthiness, uh, the registration of the airplane. Um, I need the operator's manual. I need the weight and balance okay. sheet. And then I also need my own personal license, my certificate, mm -hmm. and then uh, uh, some type of identification and my medical. Okay, some sort of photo ID. Yeah. yeah, cool. Do you need to bring your logbook? I do not. You don't have to bring your logbook. Mm -hmm. Okay. Nice. Um, that's that sounds good to me. So you mentioned um, Aero. That kind of deals with our airplane. And you said that was airworthiness, yep. registration, operating handbook, and weight and balance. How long is the airworthiness certificate good for? Does it ever expire? Um, it only expires if your annual is not current. So like if you decided to an airplane didn't get an annual for five years for some reason, mm -hmm. then that's not current anymore. It's not airworthy. Okay. So how could we make that airworthiness certificate valid once again? Um, by getting an annual done on it and okay. having it recertified and checked mm -hmm. as airworthy again. Sure. Yeah. Is there anything more than just the annual that's required? And I'm assuming the annual is required once a year, right? <coughs> it is. Yeah, yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's funny how they name those things. Yeah. Uh, so is there anything more than that that's required maintenance for aircraft? Yeah, there is. So there's okay. another acronym called Aviate, mm -hmm. um, which tells us, you know, we need our altimeter checked every um, 24 calendar months. We need um, our VORs if we're doing IFR flights. We need it checked every 30 days. Um, we need our, so our, what a pedostatic system would be the next one, um, and that needs to be checked every 24 calendar months. We need our ELT every 12, so that would be hopefully with our annual to get mm -hmm. done. And um, did I miss any other ones there? I think I might have. Transponder? Yeah, the transponder needs to be checked. So every, okay. every 24 calendar months. 24 calendar months on the transponder, okay. Yeah. And that would kind of maybe fall under the pedostatic. Yeah. Um, now, do we need a full pedostatic check? For VFR flight, or um, you need that done every twenty-four calendar months. So not for okay. VFR flight. I mean, so what does the pedostatic check involve? I'm not really sure exactly on the maintenance okay. side. What's actually sure? Yeah. yeah, no. I, so yeah. that's fine. I mean, as a private pilot, you know, yeah. I don't know. The, it says in the logbook <laughs> yeah. that you know they did a pedostatic check. How could we find out? Who would you ask? Um, I'd probably just ask a, um, a mechanic in AP. Yeah. Or sure. Go over to him. Hey, what are they checking? Yeah. And ask him what's legally required. I bet you. It's in their best interest to make sure that that airplane is legal because they're signing it off. You're going to go fly it, and they want to make money. Yeah. So if there's something required, I bet that they would they would know what that is and yep. be able to tell you. So you had mentioned transponder every 24 months and for VFR flight. Tw transponder every 24 calendar months, the annual. Yep. Um, you had mentioned the ELT every 12 calendar months. Is there any weird rules about the ELT battery? Well, yeah, so there is one. Um, if it's 50% of the life is used, okay. you have to replace it. Mm -hmm. um, or if it's been on for more than an hour, okay. I think of, of in the transmit mode, you have, sure. to, you have to get it replaced. How do you know if it's been on for more than an hour? Um, I guess you, you would probably get a call. If it was you know registered <laughs> to you, you would get a call yeah. from somebody that, hey, like your ELT is going off, what's, mm -hmm. what's going on? If it's not registered to you, you probably not you might not know until somebody told you, um, mm -hmm. or you'd probably hear it. And, okay. Or you could see... The red light flashing on yeah. our, on our flight deck, you know. What uh, what frequency would we turn on on our radios actually hear if our ELT was going off or there's an ELT going off in the yeah, air? Yeah, you could look at one uh, one twenty one five. Okay, one two one point five. We could listen to that. Um, now, you know, perhaps you know if they're checking it, you know, they say they check it within the first five minutes of every hour, right? That's the only time they're allowed to check them. Okay. Uh, and if they check it and they run it for a minute or two. And then they check it, you know, 12 months later and run it for a minute or two. Maybe they make notes in the maintenance log books every time they check it and how long it's been in operation. If that totals up to one hour, yeah. it'd be a good time to replace that battery. Yeah. So it could be something like that. Um, if they're not keeping good maintenance logs, then not so good. And interestingly enough, we'll get into that a little bit because you actually are a partner in this airplane. You know, so you actually yep. own this airplane. Yep. Um, that's a great way to do your flight training. Saves you a lot of money by buying your own airplane mm -hmm. um, or buying in with, you know, to a partnership or a club really an effective way to do it. So uh, you own the airplane. You're also the operator of the airplane. You're the pilot in command. Yep. Uh, who's responsible for maintaining those maintenance logs or ensuring that those maintenance logs are maintained? The owner operator is responsible. Okay. And so you're responsible yeah. twice. Mm -hmm. You're really definitely yeah. on the hook here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so really it's on you, the yeah. pilot in command, whether you're renting an airplane or this is your own airplane, yeah. that uh, you, know, you have to make sure that those maintenance logs are, are detailed like that so you would know if the 
ELT battery had been used for more than one hour. Yeah, hopefully. Cool. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, that sounds good. All right, so uh, going back to uh, our inspections, we had the transponder, mm -hmm. we had the annual, we had the, uh, the 12 months for the ELT. Yep. And was there anything else required for VFR flight? Like if the airplane, say you don't own it, maybe it's used by a flight school? Yeah, oh, so yeah, they would need a hundred hour. Okay. Um, so they would need a hundred hour every hundred mm -hmm. hours. Um, What's the difference between a hundred hour and an annual inspection? Just, I'm pretty sure it's just not as intensive of an inspection as mm -hmm. an annual is. So mm -hmm. I think there's, they have certain boxes they have to check off for the hundred mm -hmm. hour and then they have other boxes they need to check off for gotcha. annual. Every, okay. Yeah, it's nearly the yeah. same thing. and. It's just the difference. The biggest difference is probably you know an IA has to sign off an annual and an AMP can sign off the hundred hour. Uh, now, what if you go over that hundred hours? Um, well, can you go over that hundred hours? You can if you're taking it to a place in which the hundred hours is going to be done. Okay, um, and, and you'd, have, you'd have to get a ferry permit in order to do that. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. So maybe we would you know if we hit a hundred and you know or ninety nine point seven hours, we could fly for up to ten more hours past the hundred hours. We could fly for another two, three, four, five hours to get it somewhere, to get it done, without having to worry about that ferry permit. But you did bring up the ferry permit, which is a good idea. So let's say, you know, you just forget to get the annual done. You're busy, yeah. or you just kind of put flying on hold for a little bit, and your airplane's out of annual, you know, by maybe two or three months, and the nearest mechanic's 30 miles away, yeah. up in Birchwood, you know, and you're here at Lake Hood, and everyone here at Lake Hood, we'll just say there's no mechanics, even though there is. Mm -hmm. You need to get this thing up to Birchwood. What would you do then? Um, I would just apply for a, a ferry permit cool. for the FISDO. And okay, so them. you would call the FISDO. Yeah. What is the FISDO? Uh, it's a flight standards district office. Yeah. Okay, so that's kind of like the FAA office here in Anchorage. Yep. Um, awesome, that's like their, their local office. You know, because obviously they're headquartered in Oklahoma and Washington, D.C., but they've got yeah. A, yeah. a district office. Makes yeah. sense, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, they're a great resource to call up if you need something. Call them up and say, hey, I need a ferry permit. And even if they're not the guys, they might refer you to who to hit, who is the guy. Okay. So, um, yeah. makes sense to me. Pretty good. Um, cool. So those are our inspections. Is there anything else we want to see in those logbooks? Uh, any notices sometimes they publish every two weeks? Uh, well, yeah, so I think every, so there's ADs, you mm -hmm. know, we have airworthiness directives that we need cool. to, that hopefully your mechanic shop is taken care of and not mm -hmm. you, because otherwise it's pretty hard to look at those every two weeks and then, you know, have to actually look through it and mm -hmm. see that your airplane is required for something. Gotcha. But it's, it's valuable to do, obviously. Mm -hmm. We don't want to have, or if you see an incident happen with this type of airplane that you have, it's mm -hmm. probably good to look for ADs. Yeah, see if anything yeah. has come out. Now, how do you think you get notified of ADs? You know, you, it, it, working with a good maintenance shop is yeah. a great way. Yeah. Um, now, that you know, we said the air in this trip, it was basically good forever, as long as the airplane had all its required inspections. How long is the registration good for? Um, I believe it's two years, or I'm, I'm not. I don't, I don't remember. I think it's it, two years. I think. Well, luckily, yeah. where could we find the expiration date of the registration on your on, aircraft? On the, on the actual On the actual yeah. certificate. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. yeah. And, and you said you check that every pre-flight. Yep. You know, that's some of the required documents on board. So you don't just look and make sure it's there. You actually read it and yeah. check the expiration date. Actually, I think it's three years now. Right? Three years. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Three years is the standard. And they have a few exceptions for when they might be more or less yeah. or whatever. But um, typically three years. And they like to have that current registration because... That's one way, yeah. you know, one of the many ways you could get notified about new ADs coming out. Okay. Uh, is, you know, the uh, the owner of record uh, on that registration. So, cool, that sounds good. So those are our required inspections, and we could verify all that stuff. Where would we look to make sure all these required inspections were done? Um, what, I would look in the logbook. In the maintenance uh, so logbook. I'd look in the engine logbook, the airframe Great. logbook, all, you know. Awesome. Yeah. Very good. And um, that sounds uh, pretty good to me. I'd like to jump now... Uh, into uh, kind of some of our cross-country planning okay. and talking a little bit about weather. Yeah. Uh, so looking at uh, this paper here, mm -hmm. we've got uh, this little bit of text here at the top. Can yep. you tell me what that text is saying? So on the 26th um, of this month, 1853 Zulu, um, the winds were 150 at 4 knots, mm -hmm. and it was 10 statute miles. Visibility is clear. It's minus 24 degrees, two points minus 27. Um, the altimeter reading was 2933. And so this is like saying that it's an automated field. Like a, mm -hmm. So it gives our meat tar here, um, mm -hmm. and it's automated. Sea level pressure here was 2932. Uh, and uh, all this stuff over here, I think it's just temperature. Like it's actually shown what the temperature actually was. Okay, kind and of some, broken out for us. Temperatures. Yeah, it looks like uh, 
minus 23.9 and minus 27.2 there. So, uh, you know, it's not just minus 24 and yeah. minus 27 temperature dew point spread. It gives you a little more clear idea about the temperature dew point spread. Why? Why do you think they break it down so thoroughly for us? What do we know about temperature dew point spread that would affect us yeah. on our flight, making your go-no-go decision? Yeah, so say? I mean, typically, like, when, it, when they reach each other, we get clouds, so then we'll have, we'll have mm -hmm. bad visibility at that point. So okay. that would make it, could make a decision for us to say, hey, if it's really close, mm -hmm. know, there's a good chance we might not even see the field when we go. Okay. Yeah. When, uh, how close are we talking about? Like two, two to three, uh, two, two to three degrees is where I start getting concerned. But okay. yeah, typically about two degrees is yeah. I'd be concerned. Yeah, but. two to three degrees. You know, yeah. Anytime they're within three degrees of each other, definitely something to pay attention to and see. But luckily, it says ten statute miles and clear for right now. For right now. But because yeah. that temperature dew point spreads close, well, boy, that could change awful quick for us. Yeah, it could. And uh, the sun's out, so hopefully it wouldn't. But yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, what does the sun being out have to do with that? Tell me about that. Um, well, it's going to help heat the surface. And it's going to help heat the surface, okay. So then hopefully right at the surface, we would have warmer temperatures than the spread of the dew point there. And okay, so that would increase the temperature dew point spread. And when, yeah, we warm the surface and warm the air, we would actually kind of absorb more moisture into the air, so there'd be less chance of fog and things like that. So you're telling me that with a temperature dew point spread close like this, what happens when the sun goes down tonight at about 5 p.m.? Yeah, you would you would probably expect that there's going to be some type of ground radiation going on and it's going to get ground fog. There could yeah. be areas of ground fog all of a sudden. And would we see that in the forecast, like in yeah. half? Yeah, for sure we probably we could, you know, and it might not predict it. It may but not predict it. Yeah, it could be very yeah. local areas. Yeah. Um, what area is this TAF good for? So, so a terminal aerodrome forecast, How does that cover like 20 miles from the airport, one mile from the airport? How? Um, this one is for Anchorage, and it's five not uh, statue miles from the airport. Okay, five yeah. miles from the airport, yeah. and this one, yeah, you mentioned it was for Anchorage, P-A-N-C here. And uh, could you just read me through uh, uh -huh. what's going on there? So, yeah, the 26 at 1720 Zulu. Um, the 20, So now on the 26 from 18 Zulu to 27th on 24 Zulu, it will be, they're calling for winds at the north, uh, six knots, and plus that, uh, six statue miles of visibility in the sky clear. Okay. So they're calling for a long period of time there to be pretty clear. Okay, um, so from the 26th at 1800 Zulu to yeah. the 27th at 2400 Zulu, so about 30 hours yeah. there, they're saying it's going to be like that. Does it change any, at any yeah. point during that time? So any, and then in between, so like the little special times in mm -hmm. between this, we have the 27th at 4 Zulu. Um, okay. The wind's going to be 350 at 12 knots plus statue, six statue miles of visibility and few clouds at 10,000 and scattered at 20,000. Gotcha. Very good. Um, um, and then again, another little period of time here, they're going to have the 27th at 1900 Zulu will be winds 360 at 7 and plus six actual miles of visibility and they're calling for uh, showers in the vicinity, which is okay. be interesting. Um, it's pretty cold, so. Yeah. yeah. Now, these are all these weird Zulu times. How does that pertain to us? I mean, my phone right now says 1130 a.m. Yeah, so this one is for uh, Alaska Air. It's my, this time of year, it's minus uh, nine. Okay. So, so we got the yep. minus nine out of that, so 10 o'clock, so it's 10 a.m. essentially. Sure. Yeah. How about in the summertime, what is it? It's uh, minus eight, I believe. Minus right. eight, okay. Yeah. yeah, how I remember that is minus nine degrees in the winter and minus eight degrees in the summer. Yeah. It's just so it's a little bit warmer, warmer <laughs> in the summer. Yeah. Um, cool. Just go ahead and read for me uh, down here. What are we seeing or what can we expect here um, on the 27th at around 200 Zulu? Uh, going on down there by uh, Ketchikan. Okay, so down at Ketchikan there from the 27th at 0200 Zulu, we have, um, it's going to be winds 140 at 13, gusting 20. So there's going to be some strong southeast winds and we need some type of systems coming up. Mm -hmm. um, we have plus six miles of, uh, of statute miles of visibility. You're going to have uh, light rain scattered at one, uh, 1,500 feet and overcast at 2,500 feet. Wind shear, um, at from zero to zero, so like wind shear, northeast wind shear um, at one five zero, gusting forty. So it's pretty significant change there in, in wind direction. Okay, so, yeah, it might be, uh, yeah, wind shear or wind shift um, at about two thousand feet. Okay, 2, above feet. the surface of uh, one five zero at forty knots. So two thousand feet above the surface, blowing forty knots, yeah. and over just that you know short little distance, we're gonna have a big change in the wind. Um, speed and, that, and what kind of hazard is that for us when we're flying? I mean, is that a big deal? Or? Yeah, typically it's turbulence. I mean, so we're gonna have mm -hmm. but we're gonna have air moving in different speeds, so it's gonna mm -hmm. be 
it's going to cause viscosity between them, basically, mm -hmm. and then they're going to be turbulent. And all okay, that. gotcha. So, um, have you ever been down to Catch Can? Um, yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah beautiful area. Yeah. Um, can you tell me? You know, is that good weather to go flying then, or? I no, it wouldn't be. You're gonna have okay. light rain, and it's gonna be super windy, and in a one seventy two, mm -hmm. and it's uh, really cold. So uh, let's see if we had the temperatures up here. Um, they didn't have the temperature on there, did they? Do we have temperatures on taps? Taps, we don't. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So it might not be on there, but uh, yeah, and that uh, that wind shear, that yeah. uh, you know, that wind shift we have going on there. Kind of, uh, yeah, might be pretty interesting. And, and Catch Can's got some hills around it, right? Yeah. Yeah. What happens when we have winds blowing at 40 knots at 2,000 feet over, the mountains. over yeah. mountains? Yeah, it's going to be super, so you're going to create a lot of rotor. Okay. Um, and there's going to be really turbulent. Okay. Um, what would happen, say, if we were flying downwind of, you know, a big mountain? So there's going to be a lot of downdraft. So mm -hmm. basically we might not be able to, depending on the wind, strength and that's pretty strong that we mm. might not be able to climb something and it's going to push us into the ground potentially okay yeah. um now how far down range so we have denver here i know you know we're in alaska but yeah. you got the colorado plateau these mountains go up to like fourteen thousand feet here yeah and then the ground here is about six thousand so how far if we got a strong west wind at 40 or 50 knots mm -hmm. aloft how far down range of or downwind of the mountains think, would we be concerned about that i think they say half the distance of the height of the mountain right or maybe something like that is a good rule. So if it's 14,000 feet, you're going to want to be 7,000 feet, so over a mile away. Over a mile away, yeah. yeah um, that might be pretty applicable. You're a paraglider, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's that's an interesting thing. So, yeah, and paragliding, um, that it can certainly apply. Um, but for what we like to think about in, you know, single-engine airplanes, yeah. just know that, you know, this could continue mountain wave turbulence. The rotor might only be, yeah. you know, a few miles you yeah. know, from the mountain. But, and the rotor is really that swirly stuff that could roll your airplane upside down. And yep. It really caused some severe structural damage. But you could also get mountain wave turbulence, which yep. is crazy updrafts and downdrafts. And you could see, how would we know if there's mountain wave turbulence? I mean, you would, you would look for indications of lenticular clouds. Okay, or... lenticular clouds would be a huge clue. Yeah. And if um, we saw lenticular clouds, that, you know, those could be up to 100 miles downwind yeah. of the mountains when we have strong enough winds. And... That could be pretty exciting for us to yep. fly through. So we want to stay well clear. Now, would we expect that more on a day where there's, you know, a high pressure dominating the area and, um, you know, there's relatively no bumps, but we mm -hmm. just see these lenticular clouds? Or, you know, say we're flying around and it's just sunny and bumpy everywhere. Yeah. And which would be worse, you know, when it's bumpy everywhere or when it's actually really smooth out? So if it's really smooth out, so that's going to be worse for us because, mm -hmm. you know, we have mountain wave set up in a high pressure system. Usually when it's mm -hmm. super stable, that's when mountain wave will set up. Gotcha. And that will happen. And if that's happening, that type of turbulence is way more dangerous for airplanes than, okay. than just turbulence like you're it's saying. It's a funny thing, like stable air yeah. allows those mountain waves to travel well downwind and the thermals that we were describing yeah. aren't there to break them up and disrupt them. Yep. Kind of, when would you expect, and this is jumping into a different topic here, when would you expect wake turbulence to be worse off an aircraft or hang around a long time? So we have all these 747s flying around Anchorage. Yep. Uh, is any time that, you know, would it be stable air or unstable air would make the wake stick around longer? So the wake is going to stick around way longer in stable air. Okay. Because it's going to be kind of like, I don't know, like a good, you know, the same thing as like a lake is all... You know, mm -hmm. When it's all windy and ratted, yeah, the no wake will go through. Like a boat goes past, sure. it doesn't get whatever. It yeah, so calm, yeah. yeah, calm lake. The wake travels for a long time, and a rougher lake with a little bit of chop, the wake kind of dissipates pretty quickly. Yep. So yeah, so what you're saying is a little bit of chop or like some light wind, you know, that can kind of you know five, ten knots, fifteen knots worth of wind can kind of blow the wake out of there. Yep. But five knots or less of wind, stable air, when it's really smooth, maybe the sun just went down or something. We have stable conditions. That might make things a little exciting for us with wake. Yep. Is it just when they're taking off or landing? Or what about, you know, when we're 10 miles from Anchorage and they're climbing out and we fly underneath their path? Yeah, you can definitely get it then, too. So it's, okay. it's worse when they're taking off or landing because they're mm -hmm. slow, clean, and, and heavy at that point, okay. typically. So mm -hmm. that's typically when it's worse. But, yeah, you can still get it. I mean, when they're climbing and going, sure. you know, they're going slow at that point, mm -hmm. still climbing, still heavy. Yeah, so if we're going to take off of uh runway or there's a 747 takeoff runway seven right in okay. anchorage and the wind is um you know blowing from say uh oh 150 at you know five knots okay. and you're cleared for takeoff and runway seven left a minute later would you do that 
Um, I'd probably want to wait. I, How I mean, long would you wait? Uh, they say at least two, uh, three minutes. I okay. Mean, it depends on, so that size aircraft, I'd want to wait five, so I might, but they might not let me as well, but I'd also... Could they force you to take off? They can never force you to take off. Okay, they so... Can, they can give you crap. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah, but they can't force you, and you no. can, you're the ultimate authority there, For so... Sure. Yeah, so you can always just say, hey, no, yeah. I want three minutes, I want five minutes. Yeah. I want a taxi back to the hangar now, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, I'm out of coffee, whatever it might be. Yeah. It could be... Yeah, no such thing as an emergency takeoff, right? No. We have emergency <laughs> landings, but no emergency takeoffs, yeah. Yes. Okay, so to uh, just to talk about a little bit of this cross-country we're doing from Anchorage, or from Lake Hood, rather, up to Talkeetna. Uh -huh. um, you've got this chart here, and this, uh, when did this chart, uh, when is it valid for? Um, it's valid on the 26th of this, of today, so basically from 13 Zulu to 1900 Zulu. Um, okay. So roughly, what is that, 10 o'clock? Okay. So it's, it's good until 10 a.m. And what's it showing us around the Anchorage and Talkeetna area? We'll go ahead and pause the video right here and we will resume it online at fly8mikealpha.com in the Premium Private Pilot Ground School. The link is right in the description below if you want to go ahead and check out that course, sign up for it, and watch this full-length oral video along with several other videos that will help you prepare for your check ride, plus hundreds of videos total in that course that help you prepare for your written exam and then just flight training in general. Any questions you have on this or anything else related to flight training, feel free to leave it in the comments below or reach out to us via email at cfi at fly8mikealpha.com. We look forward to seeing you guys online in that premium private pilot ground school course. And if you can't fly every day, fly8mikealpha.com. We'll see you all on the website.